What do any of these things have to do with fractals? If you've ever heard or seen anything about chaos theory, you're probably at least somewhat familiar with the concept of fractals. But it's probably not at all obvious what on earth fractals could possibly have to do with archaeology. Well, in fact, fractals are relevant to several aspects of archaeology, and I'm going to talk about some of those today. You might be familiar with fractals because of some of the startling images that are associated with them, such as Mandelbrot sets. But more generally, fractals are something that results from simple deterministic processes that create patterns that exhibit self-similarity at different scales. Fractals are a feature of complex dynamical systems, as found in what's popularly known as chaos theory. Lots of things in both nature and culture have fractal properties. For example, a jagged coastline has infinite length and appears very similar in shape as we change the scale, right down to the point where the water touches the edges of pebbles and grains of sand on the edge of the beach. If we try to measure the length of a coastline, such as the length of the main British Isles seen here, the result depends on the precision of the instrument we use. Using something like rulers to try to measure it on a map is likely to result in a fairly low estimate of the coastline's length. Following the coastline with a measuring wheel like this one would lead to a much greater length. And if we followed every nook and cranny, or got down on our hands and knees and tried to trace every pebble at the water's edge, we'd get a longer length still. In principle, the coastline's length approaches infinity as we use instruments with greater and greater precision, and as we try to follow the coast with greater and greater detail. The first person to recognize that coastlines had fractal properties, in fact he invented the term fractal, was Benoit Mandelbrot, inventor of the Mandelbrot set that you see here. Coastlines aren't the only natural phenomena that have fractal properties. There's the winding and braiding of river channels, the branching of broccoli florets and tree branches. Fluctuations in the weather have fractal properties, as do fluctuations in the population of humans and animals, and even fluctuations in stock market indices. As we'll see shortly, we can also find fractals in human settlement patterns. These are just some of the ways in which fractals can be relevant to archaeology. When we think of things in our environment, we tend to think in terms of two dimensions, like an infinitely thin sheet of paper. And when that paper has thickness, or turns into a board, it has a third dimension. But what if I told you that this rather spiky looking shape, known as a Cesaro fractal, has 1.5 dimensions? What? Even more weirdly, if we connect three of these fractals together to create an object that looks like it's enclosing some space, it turns out to have zero volume, but infinite area. To demonstrate, let's look at a very simple kind of fractal that's related to the one just described, called a Koch curve. It starts with a line segment that we divide into three equal parts. We remove the middle third and replace it with two angled pieces that are of the same size as the piece we just removed. We now repeat this process on each of the four line segments that are left, and then repeat it again on each of the 16 line segments that result from that step. Repeating this process indefinitely results in a Koch curve that happens to have 1.26 dimensions. And if instead of starting out with a line segment, we start with an equilateral triangle, the result is a fractal called a Koch snowflake. It also has 1.26 dimensions. So what does this fractional dimension business really mean? Well, a shape like the Koch curve cannot be one-dimensional, even though it has a start and an end, just like a line segment. Unlike a line segment, its length is infinite. And it can't be two-dimensional either, because even though it looks kind of two-dimensional, it actually encloses zero area. Consequently, it has to have a dimension somewhere between one and two. And notice, by the way, that it looks a little bit like a coastline. Similarly, if we look at this other fractal, called a Menger sponge, it looks kind of three-dimensional, but it actually can't be. Because, despite appearances, it actually has no volume. 
At the same time, it can't be two-dimensional because its surface area is infinite. Consequently, it has 2.7 dimensions. Effectively, what the fractal dimension is measuring is how much the degree of detail changes when we change the scale, or how many self-similar copies do we get when we go from one scale to a smaller scale. As it turns out, that coastline of the British Isles has about 1.2 dimensions, while the more jagged coastlines of Norway and Greenland have about 1.3 dimensions. And Israel's much smoother coastline would have something closer to 1.1 dimensions. These differences among coastlines are due to variations in such things as bedrock geology, the spacing of rivers that drain into the sea, and the effect of wave action on erosion. Okay, we're now five minutes into this video and I still haven't told you why any of this matters. I think a good place to start is this article by Brown, Witchy, and Leibovitch, which they published in 2005. One of the archaeologically important applications of fractals that they talk about is fragmentation. One of the inescapable truths of archaeological fieldwork is that almost none of the remains that we recover are whole artifacts, or even whole bones or whole seeds. Instead, we deal with fragments. In fact, in the case of pottery, it's so rare for us to find whole vessels that our usual unit of analysis is the sherd, or pottery fragment. These sherds and other kinds of fragments can sometimes be quite large, and other times they are a little bit smaller, or perhaps very small. Potentially getting down to microflakes and small crumbs of pottery less than a millimeter in diameter. For the most part, this necessity to deal with fragments is a little bit frustrating. In the case of pottery, archaeologists have had to learn to be quite creative in how to reconstruct a whole vessel on the basis of its constituent sherds. Whether they do that physically by actually joining the sherds together or do it on paper or by using digital tools. However, archaeologists have also learned how to yield useful information from fragments. For example, refitting flakes and their fragments to cores can tell us a lot about the reduction sequence of lithics. While studying the size distribution of some kinds of fragments can tell us things about site formation processes, such as trampling. High traffic surfaces that have experienced trampling by humans or their animals are likely to have, on average, smaller fragments. While middens, where people disposed of their trash directly, are more likely to have large fragments. You might well ask what any of this has to do with fractals, but as it turns out, fragmentation has aspects that are fractal-like. And this is particularly true of those size distributions. You might think that the sensible way to approach the problem of distinguishing, say, a trampled surface from a midden deposit would be just to measure the maximum length of all the pot sherds found in it, or perhaps the surface area of the exterior surface of the sherds, with the idea that the average for the trampled surface would be lower than for the midden deposit. Intuitively, this may make sense, but it's actually wrong. The real average size for any fragmented remains approaches being infinitely small. In a sense, that average is meaningless. And that's because it's so dependent on the size of the smallest artifacts we decide to measure. As already noted, we could in principle measure sherds down to the size of the little crumbs like the ones in this little vial. However, in practice, nobody does that. Instead, they might measure every sherd bigger than 2 centimeters, or bigger than 4 centimeters. The point is, the lower cutoff for what deserves to be measured is completely arbitrary, yet has a tremendous impact on the value of statistics like mean and standard deviation. Since mean size won't really work then, for characterizing the degree of fragmentation in our assemblage, we can turn to the fractal dimension instead. Just as with those weird fractal shapes we saw earlier, the degree of fragmentation in an assemblage has fractal properties and therefore fractal dimension. So how do we measure that? One option is to take our collection of fragments, whether those are pottery sherds, lithic flakes, bone fragments, or something else, and run them through a stack of nested sieves. 
For each size category, corresponding with the sieve aperture for one of the sieves, we then measure how much pottery or lithics is in that sieve. In Brown et al.'s article, they applied this method to an assemblage of obsidian flakes. Realizing that each sieve was catching flakes of the aperture diameter or larger, they counted how many flakes were on each sieve, but then used the cumulative distribution of flakes across the range of sieve sizes. So, in the table you see here, n is the number of flakes found on each sieve, while n greater than s is the cumulative number of flakes for that sieve size or larger. They then transform the data into logarithms, here using the natural logarithms for both size and the cumulative number of flakes, and plotted those values on a graph. They then fitted a straight line to the dots in the graph using regression, and then we can measure the slope of this line by dividing the rise by the run. In this case, because the line is declining to the right, it's a negative value. So it's a slope of minus 1.37, which corresponds to a fractal dimension of d equals positive 1.37. We would expect this value of d to vary depending on whether each flake tended to break into several pieces or many pieces on each breakage event. Trampling of a flake, for example, is likely to crush the flake into many pieces. When archaeologists study settlement systems of the past, they're often interested in the relationships between sites of different sizes, like small villages, larger towns, and big cities in an urban landscape. Quite often they try to classify sites mainly on the basis of site size, on the assumption that bigger sites had more people, probably more services and economic power, and sometimes more political power. And sometimes they look for spatial relationships among sites that might indicate some kind of political or economic hierarchy. For example, they might look for crystalline settlement lattices. This is a model of settlement whereby a large city is surrounded by six smaller cities, each in turn surrounded by smaller towns and those who are surrounded by smaller villages. However, we need to ask ourselves whether it's realistic to classify sites into neat little packages like towns, villages, and cities. In many settlement landscapes, there's a continuum among sites in terms of their size, population, services, and economic clout. And the landscape can look really patchy, with some areas quite densely populated with clusters of settlements and other parts having much more scattered settlement. As with other phenomena that involve changes in scale, it's possible that we have fractal relationships among these settlements. When archaeologists study ancient settlement patterns, especially for societies that had urbanism, they often think in terms of the rank-size relationships among the sites. In fact, a German physicist named Felix Auerbach had observed way back in 1913 that when you look at the population sizes in modern countries, the second largest city was usually about half the size of the largest city, the third largest city was a third that size, the fourth largest city was a quarter that size, and so on. Over the next 20 years, it was found that this relationship applied to lots of other things besides cities and their rank in a settlement system, and it became known as Zipf's rule, after the American linguist George Zipf, who applied it to the frequency of words in the English language during the 1930s. Going back to our settlement pattern example, it is typical to show this relationship by using logarithmic scales on both the site size axis and the rank axis. This turns the relationship into a straight line. Notice too that the conventional way of showing this graph is with size on the y-axis rather than the x-axis as we saw previously. That means the slope is run over rise instead of rise over run. We can also represent that relationship by an equation. PR equals P1 over R. For the moment, ignore K or assume that it equals 1. P1 is the size of the biggest site, and R equals the rank. So for the second biggest site, R equals 2, and its size is P1 divided by 2. In other words, it's half the size of the biggest site. Since it's nice to work with straight lines, it's usual to work with the logarithms of those values, and translating that equation 
results in log PR equals log P1 minus K log R. For the original applications of Zipf's rule, it was assumed that K equals 1. As it turns out, the basic version of Zipf's law does not apply to all settlement patterns, including a lot of archaeological ones, because the second rank site is either a little more or a little less than half the size of the biggest site. In other words, the value of K is not 1. Among archaeologists, Laxton and Kavanaugh were probably the first to notice that this relationship is a fractal one, as K is just the reciprocal of the fractal dimension D. In other words, D equals 1 over K. Bill Kavanaugh applied this kind of fractal analysis to the archaeological sites that he had found in his survey of Laconia in the Peloponnesian region of Greece. During that survey, he had found dozens of sites dating from the Neolithic period onwards, and he constructed rank size graphs for each period, like this one for the Early Bronze Age. Notice here that instead of showing the site size in hectares, he shows it as a proportion of the size of the largest site. As often happens with archaeological survey data, the dots don't actually make a straight line, but kind of drop off rapidly at the lower right part of the graph. That fall off among the smallest sites is no doubt due to the fact that a lot of sites are missing from the survey, simply because of sampling issues and the fact that these small sites are often very hard to detect. But we can fit a line to the larger sites that are probably not subject to these sampling issues. And on the basis of the slope of that line, Kavanaugh was able to infer a fractal dimension of about 1.3. I prefer to use a line that passes exactly through the largest site, and this results in a fractal dimension of around 1.67. This fractal dimension might seem pretty esoteric, but it actually tells us something about the relationship among sites in a settlement system. For the classic modern cases that Auerbach studied, where k equals 1 and therefore d also equals 1, it describes a typical settlement structure in a nation state, with one very large industrial center and a number of smaller cities, each in turn surrounded by small cities, towns, and villages. In the case of the early Bronze Age settlement system of Laconia, however, the fractal dimension of somewhere between 1.3 and 1.7 tells us something very different, namely that the settlement system was less hierarchical, with several of the larger sites being of approximately equal size. By contrast, for the Classical Greek and Hellenistic periods, Kavanaugh found that the fractal dimension was less than 0.7. This suggests that the second, third, and fourth rank sites are unusually small, and that the largest settlement dominates the entire settlement system. The fact that some rank size distributions can have fractal properties reminds us that fractals might be relevant to other aspects of settlement patterns as well. So it should come as no surprise that the spatial distribution, and not just the size distribution, of settlements can also have fractal properties. In fact, we can measure the fractal dimension of a settlement system by using the box counting method. We begin by imposing a grid of large boxes over the map of the area, count how many squares have at least one site in them, and then subdivide the squares into smaller and smaller squares, at each stage counting how many squares contain sites. In this case, I began with squares that were 16 units on a side and then 8, and then 4, and then 2, and then 1. It doesn't matter what the units are, because fractals are scale-free. Once we have our data, with S being the size of the boxes, A being the number of boxes that contain sites, we can calculate the logarithms of those two values. When we then plot a graph showing the relationship between those two logarithms, we typically get a straight line. We can find this line either by a regression analysis or we can estimate it by eye. The next step is to find the slope of the line, which we can get by dividing the rise by the run. The rise is negative because the line is actually going down to the right, and here it's minus 0.85, while the run is 0.6. The fractal dimension is just the negative of the ratio of these two values which in this case is 1.42. Note that this indicates that the settlement pattern is neither one-dimensional nor two-dimensional, but actually 1.4 dimensional, indicating that the settlement pattern is somewhere in between linear and grid-like.
since lines are one-dimensional. In this case, the fact that most of the sites are arranged along rivers and canals probably contributes to it being closer to a linear distribution than to a grid-like one. A common problem in archaeology is to determine the uses of ancient artifacts, including lithics. A good approach to this is to look for damage on the tool that resulted from use and compare this to damage on tools that we've used experimentally. We can compare the character and distribution of such things as polish and striations and scratches that occur on both the experimental and the archaeological artifacts using low power or high power microscopy. Here, for example, you can see the kind of polish that occurs when the contact material is antler. While this polish comes from using a flint sickle to cut through reeds. However, a downside of both low and high power microscopy is that they require subjective assessments of the wear and polish that can be seen in the image. Several newer methods measure surface topography or texture, allowing quantitative assessment of surface wear and polish. In this example of confocal microscopy used on a, the edge of a tool that was used to scrape hides, we get quantitative measurements over a small area of the tool edge. This can facilitate statistical comparisons against other tools. But these data can also be used for a fractal analysis. A cross-section through the scratches and striations produces a graph that looks very similar to a jagged coastline or to those stock market fluctuations I showed earlier. The tiny scratches have still tinier scratches within them, showing self-similarity at different scales. Among those who have applied fractal analysis to usewear studies are James Stemp and his colleagues, as in this article from 2009. Taking highly magnified profiles along short sections near the use edge of the tool, we can fit line segments to the profile, much as though we were measuring the coast of Britain with a ruler and then repeat this process with shorter line segments, and then yet again with ones that are shorter still. At each of these scales, we record how much detail these line segments are capturing. For example, we can record how many of the line segments have valleys in them, meaning portions of the profile that go below the line segment. Ideally, we'd like to do this with many profiles, or at least several of them, in order to get a decent sample size. But this profile will serve for the purposes of demonstration. For each segment size, I counted how many segments had at least one valley in them. Then I took the logarithms of those values and plotted them on a graph. As with the previous examples you've seen, we can then fit a line to this graph and calculate its slope. In this case, the slope was minus 0.76, so the fractal dimension is 0.76. We would follow this process on profiles taken on tools that were used with different contact materials and different ranges of motion to see if different combinations of contact material and types of motion uh, resulted in different fractal dimensions. Decorative patterns on things like rugs and pottery can also have fractal properties, although the self-similarity may be restricted to only two or three changes of scale. Textiles tend to provide good examples of this because weaving lends itself to having small geometrical shapes nested within larger shapes. But decorated pottery is often also a good example. Whether the decoration consists of incision or impression or painted designs. And we can measure the fractal dimension of these designs in the same way that we measured the fractal dimension of settlement patterns using the box counting method although ideally we'd want to use smaller boxes than the smallest size I use here. Using boxes that are 16 units per side, and then 8, and then 4, and then 2, and then 1, we count how many boxes include the pattern. In this case we'll count boxes that have at least part of a dot in them. And we compile our data, with S being the box size, and A the number of boxes that contain at least a part of a dot. We take the logarithms of those two values, plot the logarithms against each other, and then we try to fit a line to the dots. In this case, it doesn't make a perfect straight line, but we fit it as best we can, preferably by regression. The slope of this line is minus 1.44, meaning that the fractal dimension is 
By coincidence, this is pretty similar to the fractal dimension we had for that settlement pattern, just a little bit closer to being linear than to being two-dimensional. Possibly that's because the dots are grouped into sinusoidal bands that are somewhat linear in their organization. You might still be wondering, what's the point of measuring this fractal dimension? Well, it's possible that two different potting communities, making pots with substantially similar designs, might still make those designs in ways that gave them different fractal dimensions. This might allow us to identify the products of those two different potting communities. To summarize, fractal geometry describes many of the things that archaeologists deal with because they're complex, rough, or irregular. I only talked about a few of them here, but they include the size distributions of broken fragments, the texture of rough surfaces, even when that roughness is only visible under high magnification, the outlines of tool edges, and site size distributions. They also include the spatial aspect of settlement patterns, the organization of decoration on things like pottery, and fluctuations in things like population density. Even though we can't measure those fluctuations directly very often, we can often study them using agent-based modeling. Well, thank you for making it to the end of this video. I hope you've learned that there are several ways in which fractals might help us understand such things as site formation processes, settlement patterns, and even use wear on lithics. If you'd like to learn more about these topics, please check out the references I've placed at the end of the video, and if you'd like to be updated when I make new videos, please click on the subscribe button down below. Thank you, and stay safe.